Hi, I'm John Sluter. I'm your Bible friend from Purdue. In the last segment on the subject of King Saul, I said that in this segment, what I was going to do is discuss uh, Saul's rise uh, and the events that led to his downfall. I take it all back because I've decided that what would be more helpful would be to discuss the family drama that begins uh, 1 Samuel. One of the reasons that I want to start here in this little family drama is because it's the first story in Samuel, the book of Samuel, and in this family drama, the writer of Samuel nests some of the ideas and themes that will be perpetuated through the book of Samuel and are very central to what he wants to communicate to his reader. There's a tradition called the Midrash where scholars have respectfully read into the story, filled in the background, filled in some of the details. And I'm going to do something like that. You may agree or disagree. Part of the joy of scripture is those kinds of agreements and disagreements. It's a family drama that involves basically three main characters. There's a husband, Elkanah, and he has two wives, Penina and Hannah. I assume that Penina is the first wife and she's bitter. And in a way you can understand she might look at her husband and think that when she married him, he wasn't that big of a deal. And she bore children for him. And then he grew prosperous and decided to add a second wife. And to her, three's a crowd. And as if the addition of a second wife did not throw enough sand in Penina's dough, Penina also perceives that her husband Elkanah has fallen deeply in love with this new partner in the marriage, Hannah. And she perceives that compared to his love for Hannah, Elkanah's love for her, Penina, has grown cold. So her resentment is not mysterious in its origin. However, her way of dealing with it is quite destructive. Now, Hannah was bitter in her heart, but for a different reason. She was childless. For some reason, she could not produce children in this marriage with Elkanah. And that was a very big deal in ancient Israel. It was, for a woman, an immeasurable tragedy because women were valued in that time for cultural reasons for their capacity to produce children. So as a woman, as a person, she was devalued and that stung her spirit. Robert Alter is a superb translator and commentator on the Hebrew scriptures. And the word that Hannah uses to describe her soul, her spirit, uh, in his translation is that she says uh, she is a bleak spirited woman. And in a footnote, Professor Alter explains that what he translates as bleak spirited is more literally hard spirited. And the image from that literal translation is an interesting one. You think of something being rock hard, you almost think about, it, it causes me to remember the rock that Moses struck in the wilderness from which the water flowed. And that's how a soul, I think, is designed to work. That is, things flow from our soul. Hopefully, good things flow from our soul. Companionability, love, generosity, kindness. And this stream from our souls 
mixes with the streams from other souls to form a social river that carries society forward. But Hannah, because of the hardness of her soul, cannot produce that flow, cannot contribute that kindness, that love, that generosity. It cannot flow from her own soul and mingle and contribute to the social river. So this hardness closes her off in the same way that the closure of her womb closes her off from fulfillment of her destiny and affirmation of her womanhood. And it didn't help Hannah's spirit that Penina was ruthless in taunting her because that's how Penina manifested her bitterness. Every year this little family group Elkanah and Penina and Hannah and Penina's children would make a pilgrimage to Shiloh. Shiloh was the cultic center of ancient Israel at that time. The priest at Shiloh was a man named Eli, and he had two sons, two corrupt sons. Their names were Phineas and Hophni. And this pilgrimage would have ritual and celebratory components. The ritual part, the worship of God, would include sacrifice of an animal or animals. And that was related to the more festive part of this pilgrimage because part of that animal would be shared with the family that bought it, with Elkanah and his two wives. They would cook it and eat it. I would suppose that all during the year there was some level of provocation by Penina of Hannah, but it was during these pilgrimages that she was most provocative. It was during these pilgrimages that she was explicitly provocative. She would taunt Hannah about her childlessness. Why? Probably for more than one reason. One reason certainly would be that it was Elkanah's habit during the feast pursuant to these pilgrimages to show his affection for Hannah by giving her a double portion of meat that had to burn Penina, and might have been a large reason why she chose these festivals to provoke her perceived rival. But it was more than that. And there may have been a more Machiavellian reason, because by using these times of celebration to provoke Hannah especially. Penina was spoiling for Hannah the most celebratory time of the year. And there's even a more cruel explanation because these pilgrimages were times of worship. And by year after year after year provoking Hannah and reminding her of her childlessness during these pilgrimages, she compelled Hannah to associate these pilgrimages, these times of worship, with the thing that hurt her most about her life. And so these times that should have been times of joyful worship became associated by Hannah with the most painful thing about her life, and that had to drive a wedge between her and God. Let me say one other thing about this. If Penina did not say explicitly to Hannah that God was against her and God was the reason that she could not have children, then Hannah would already have assumed that. Because in that time, that was the assumption when something tragic like that happened. They didn't have, obviously, the medical knowledge that our doctors and nurses have in our times. So that was the only explanation. And being the only explanation, 
that was the explanation that nested in their minds. So in addition to having this sorrow because she couldn't have children, she also had to feel that God was against her. And that was her sorrow beyond her sorrow. It was a sense of hopelessness. And it anticipates something that Eli says to his corrupt sons later in 1 Samuel. He tells them that if you have a conflict with a person, at least you can go to God and maybe God will sort out that problem. But if your problem is with God, there's nobody greater to appeal to. So here's poor Hannah at a time that she should be rejoicing in deepest sorrow. She cannot eat. She cannot enjoy the feast. She's sitting at the table weeping. And because Elkanah loves her so much, he tries to console her. But his consolation is somewhat ham-handed. He goes to her and he says, Don't be so sorrowful. Am I not worth ten sons to you? And that shows that he's oblivious to certain things. He doesn't recognize her pain beyond the pain. That is, that she has this pain of being hated by God. That is, if anything, worse than just the fact of her childlessness. And he also seems oblivious to the fact that Hannah is being tormented by Penina, because there's nothing in the narrative about him rebuking Penina. And there's nothing in the story about him telling Hannah, listen, forget what she says. She doesn't matter. I do. But Hannah says nothing. And her silence is not that mysterious. There are a number of reasons for her not to say anything. There are a number of reasons why she would hold this in, her agony. Most fundamentally is that if she replies to Elkanah's attempt to console her by telling him that he's basically missing the point, that would humiliate him. Also, as to the fact that she is hated by God, she realizes that he cannot help. And finally, it's plausible that she realizes that a trap has been laid for her and she doesn't want to fall into it. Let me explain that. It's plausible, I think, that Penina wants to drag Hannah down to her level. And there would be some practical ramifications of it if Hannah were to pour poison into the ear of her husband Elkanah concerning his other wife, Penina. Suppose that she succumbed to that temptation and suddenly Elkanah has two wives pouring it into his ears from both sides. Suppose this keeps up for a while. At some point, just to have peace, Elkanah might have to make a choice between one of the two wives. And Hannah will lose. For one thing, she has to vest herself of that quality of spirit that endears her to her husband. Second, Penina is the side of the family with the children. They are his future. They are his legacy. They are the ones who will take care of him in his old age. So it would not even be a close contest. 
Hannah doesn't fall for it. She holds in her grief. She bears it until she can't anymore. And when she can't bear it anymore, she says nothing but she leaves the table. She goes to the temple. Hannah is looking very much like another character in the Bible who felt that God was against him, namely Job. All kinds of tragedies befell Job and finally his friends came to him and he couldn't even persuade his friends that he had done nothing to deserve this, this series of malign events that befell him. And unable to persuade his friends, Job sought a vertical solution. He wanted to go before God. He wanted God to admit that he had done nothing wrong. Hannah is like Job. She wants the vertical solution. So she gets up from the feast and goes to the temple. And don't you imagine that all the way there, as she's going to the temple, there are little voices in her heart and they grow angrier and louder as she gets close to the temple. And they tell her, go back. God will not hear you. God will not answer you. God is against you. Maybe they even sound like the voice of Peninnah. But Hannah's agony and her determination are such that she does not stop until she gets into the temple and she pours her heart out to God. What does she tell God? We don't know everything she says, but we know that she makes an extravagant promise. The promise is that if God lets her have a son, she will give the son back to him. For his whole life, he will not let a razor touch his hair. That makes him like a Nazarite. Nazarites were people who did not cut their hair, they did not drink wine, they did not live in anything more sophisticated than a tent. And in all likelihood, they represented to ancient Israel a nostalgia for the ancient days, the days in the wilderness, when they were dependent upon God and therefore closer to God. For Hannah, one suspects that either a yes or a no would be acceptable answers from God. The only thing that wouldn't help at all would be continued silence. If God says yes, wonderful, she gets a son. If he says no, at least she knows where she stands and she can move on. She gets an answer. She gets it from Eli. Eli walks in. Eli sees her weeping and speaking wordlessly. Her lips are moving, no sound comes out. And it's a sign of the times, or at least Eli's understanding of those times, that it does not occur to him that he is witnessing a woman pouring out her heart to God in the temple. He assumes that she's drunk, and he rebukes her. Hannah defends herself, but her defense of herself is telling too. She says the minimum necessary to justify herself. She speaks respectfully to him. But apart from the respectful language that she addresses him with, she doesn't talk about many of the things she could have. All she says is that she's a woman with a bleak heart and she's pouring out her soul to God. She's not there to pour her heart out to some virtual stranger. She's there to talk to God. He's a decent man. She has touched his heart and he says, go in peace. God grant what you ask for. And that's the answer that Hannah has been looking for. She gets up, she leaves, she returns to the feast. 
and she truly joins it. She's happy. And what happens to her heart also happens to her womb. This little family group goes home, and in the fullness of time, not too long, she gets a son. She names him Samuel. When Samuel is weaned, she is true to her word. She returns with him to Shiloh, and she gives him over to Eli, so that Samuel may spend his life serving the Lord. From year to year, that family group goes back, and every time they go back, she sees her son, and Eli gives the family a blessing. Hannah is blessed. She has numerous children. Nevertheless, I assume that this separation is painful for Hannah and painful for Samuel. But as to Hannah, I have to assume that not a day goes by, not an hour goes by, where she doesn't lift up a prayer to God for her son. And as if God is answering those prayers, Samuel grows up and he becomes one of the great prophets of Israel. You're familiar with the saying, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It seems to apply to this case because you have to believe that for as long as Samuel is in Shiloh and as long as Hannah lives, her heart is there in the temple in Shiloh with her firstborn son. I lift my glass to soldiers gay and bold. For a rope like you, with courage flaming, thrill with joy, thrill with joy when they come back behold. See the rain, a throng with crowds of people, the seats are filled above and below. Loud bells ring out from every people. All the world has come, has come to the shore. Heart for shouting, what friends it voices when the bull flies out with angry roar. At his end, the sorry roar rejoices. Sure of honor when the fight is o'er. Look out, prepare, look out, prepare. Oh. 